talk in this presentation, um, what I'm going to do is to start off, uh, well, not start off, but we're going to talk about three aspects of CRISPR. One is what the actual meaning of CRISPR is in the field of molecular biology. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about where it, where it originated and what it really means there. Secondly, we'll talk about an extension of that term itself as CRISPR has become used in the field and particularly as it's gone toward a more medical uh, application. Uh, that term itself has now been extended. So it means a lot more than it was originally intended to mean when it was first coined. And then finally, um, when we get there, I'm going to incorporate this in a more general discussion of genetic information, of, of genetic engineering. Uh, it's something I think a lot of people have become a little bit more familiar with, particularly as CRISPR has come along. And we'll be good. Thank you. And we'll we'll um, we'll get into that a little bit, and probably it'll it'll engender a little bit of discussion. Um, now, uh, here we go. Hopefully, you'll see my my cursor is going to be a little bit bigger than normally, and that you see because some of the slides that I'm going to show um, have a lot of information and they'll go through and hopefully you'll be able to follow it with a bigger cursor. Uh, the term itself, CRISPR, is an acronym. It means it, it, when, you, when you figure out what those letters are, it, it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. It's quite an acronym. Now, I have found in the past five, 10 years, that molecular biology has really incorporated a lot of acronyms. I can't read a paper in that field or even in the popular literature um, without encountering acronyms or abbreviations, which makes me go on someplace else to find out what they mean and so forth. So I was a little bit annoyed with all the acronyms that I see. I'm not sure about other fields. Physics, I don't think has so much. Computers, computer science and so forth. I'm not that familiar with, so I, and I don't read the papers in that field that much. But I know that molecular biology is really a lot of acronyms, and I used to get flustered at it. But the more I think about it, I think it's good, because what happens is with an acronym, you have a lot of information. Once you know what the acronym means, you're conveying a fair amount of information in just one or two um, words that once you have it, it really allows you to carry on and use your knowledge much more quick, quickly than um, you would without the acronym. Okay, um, we'll get into what that is. Now, when I saw this, and I encountered this maybe six, seven years ago, I had an idea from my background in, in molecular biology of what it meant, uh, but one word really stood out to me, and that's the word palindromic. I'd never seen that in anything I had read uh, in, in, in general in molecular biology. And a palindrome is, uh, means that the information that's being conveyed is the same when, when read forward or backwards. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one is a palindrome. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one is a palindrome. Uh, the names Anna and Hannah are palindromes. So I thought, well, I have a sense of what uh, this means in genetics or in molecular biology, but it turned out that my intuitive sense of what it meant was incorrect. When we get to the actual discussing CRISPR, we'll see what it really means and that it is correctly used, but there's a little twist to its meaning. Uh, before I actually get into CRISPR itself, talked uh, about CRISPR itself. I want to um, spend some time on a background. Um, I, I have a sense that most of the uh, people who are in this group um, are not in molecular biology or in biochemistry. And, and thus, um, what I want to do is to build up sort of a knowledge base so that when we get to actual CRISPR, you'll have some sense of where it fits into our knowledge and have some context in which to um, incorporate what we talk about with CRISPR. <clears throat> so I'll start off uh, assuming that everyone's had at least high school chemistry and maybe college chemistry and, and remember a little bit about it. And I'll go on from there. 
Um, and if some of you get bored with it, uh, you, know, you can tune out for at least the first maybe half hour, whatever it is that we go through here. What, I'm do what I've done, first of all, is listed chemical bonds um, typically found in chemistry um, in, or in decreasing order of strength. So the strongest bond is at the top. The weakest bond you find in chemistry is at the bottom. Um, the first one is the covalent bond. And the covalent bonds, what happens is that the electrons are shared between the atoms. So if, for example, if you have a carbon-carbon bond, the electrons, each, each atom shares one electron. So there's two electrons in this bond, okay? Uh, this bond is shown here. Usually it's shown with a single dash when you read the literature. Um, there are two electrons, but you don't know which electron comes from which atom, uh, either from quantum mechanical calculations or even experimentation. You don't know which one the, the electron, uh, that uh, specific electron comes from, but there's two electrons that form this bond. And, and typical car, uh, covalent bonds are carbon-carbon, carbon-oxygen, um, and you can have double bonds and even triple bonds between atoms. So here I've shown a double bond. Um, you also can have obviously uh, covalent bonds between carbon and nitrogen and so forth. So when you see something like this, what it means is that there's a covalent bond here, one here, one here, and so forth, okay? Uh, the second type, the second form is, a second type of bond is an ionic bond. Um, sodium chloride is probably a, a, one of the most excellent examples of that. And in this instance, what happens when the two atoms come together is that the valence electrons in the, in the shell of one of the atoms, for example, sodium, is not totally filled in that valence shell. And if you remember chemistry, you always, the, the, the atoms want to fill it. So when they form molecules, they want to fill that valence shell. Now, sodium is, has only one electron in its outer shell, so it's easy to give that one up. And chloride has seven electrons in its outer shell. It wants to fill up to make eight, which makes it a nice uh, neutral atom. And so it will try to take it. So often what you see is that sodium kind of gives up its electron to chlorine. And so... It's sodium has a much more positive nature to it. Chloride has a more negative nature. And in solution, uh, particularly aqueous solutions, water solutions, they can actually, these two atoms can fall apart so that they exist in solution as ions. So the sodium would be a positive ion, chloride would be a negative ion. But when they form molecules, what's happening is that the electrons are kind of shifted from one atom to the other. The third type of bond is what's called a hydrogen bond. Now, hydrogen bonds occur because from physics, electrostatic attraction between hydrogen and lone pair electrons on electronegative atoms, such as oxygen or nitrogen. What happens here is that this hydrogen is being is covalent, covalently bonded to this oxygen, but this oxygen has much more negative charge to it than the hydrogen does. So the hydrogen becomes somewhat positively charged. The oxygen uh, always has what we call lone pair electrons, that is electrons in, in the outer shell, which have not been bonded, but they sit there. So they're a negative charge. So there's actually a plus minus attraction, electrostatic attraction. And that can help form, or it does form, what we call hydrogen bonds. Uh, another example, of course, or not of course, is nitrogen to hydrogen. And another one is oxygen to hydrogen, which has been covalently bonded to a nitrogen. It doesn't care uh, what the covalent bond that this particular molecule has. Um, it just, it's usually, it's always bonded to a, to a negative charge uh, or, or to, a, to a molecule that has an electronegative aspect to it. So you can actually get uh, hydrogen to, to nitrogen, uh, hydrogen bonds. They're usually denoted by double bars here, or you'll see maybe a, a long single bar. So when we go on, you may see these, these uh, structures themselves. And then finally, uh, there's the hydrophobic bond. And hydrophobic bonds occur sort of as a negative of the hydrogen bond. 
what's happening here is that you've got molecules that have a large number of, of, of atoms in them that have no electronegative atoms. And thus, um, they want to exclude water. And so they associate because of the fact that there's um, atoms around them that are electronegative that want the hydrogen bond. So the hydrophobic bonds occur, for example, in fats or oils. So your cells, the cell membranes in your cells are formed from hydrophobic bonds because of lots of carbon hydrogen um, uh, polymers there that have that associate with each other. And they do that in order to get away from water. And so that's how the hydrophobic bonds occur. Uh, if, if you have questions as we go through, by all means, ask them. Uh, I'm going to come to some places where we'll have, where I'll have kind of a break point where you can try to have me go back if I haven't explained something well, or if you have some questions about it. All right, now let's go into what is um, some basic biology here. And I wanna start off with heredity. Uh, people have wondered about heredity for a long time, for centuries. They've asked the questions, why is a blonde, blue-eyed set of parents have blonde, blue-eyed kids? Why do dark-skinned, dark-haired parents have dark-haired, uh, dark-skinned uh, children? So heredity has been something that's been thought about for an awful long time um, because of the fact that these traits are being passed on from one generation to another. Uh, the first person that comes to mind, I think most of us have, have seen this, is Mendel um, a few centuries ago. And Mendel studied peas. And he was fortunate in the sense that the 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 organism that he chose to study just happened to have traits that were easily decipherable. And he kept a lot of records about this. So he studied long, uh, long plants, short plants, and wrinkled and smooth uh, peas themselves. And he deciphered a lot of what we now take for granted in heredity. And one of the major uh, contributions that Mendel made by using mathematical analysis of what he was seeing is that the parents pass on uh, one, let's say, attribute to an offspring, and the other parent sends on another copy of that same attribute to the offspring. So it turns out that each offspring, each individual, has two copies of some hereditary information as attributes. Now, which copy gets expressed in terms of what you see depends on if one of the copies is stronger than the other. In other words, if it's dominant. If it's dominant, it's going to be expressed no matter whether the other parent gave an, uh, its copy of the attribute, which was uh, what we call recessive. Um, but it didn't matter. So if the offspring had two copies that were dominant, it was, it, you saw that. If, it, if the offspring got one copy dominant, one copy recessive, you only saw the dominant. But if both parents gave the recessive trait to the offspring, then you saw the recessive. And that's, what, that's the, the chief contribution that Mendel gave. Um, as time went on, people were studying this and they, they, collab or they corroborated what Mendel had shown, and microscopy, microscopy was being um, developed then. So you're beginning to look inside cells and you're beginning to see various features inside the cells. And it became apparent that these hereditary um, traits were actually held in then what we, what's called the nucleus, which uh, appears in higher organisms. So they knew that these traits came from the nucleus. And as they did more and more with this, they, they, they uh, refined how they were looking at it. They were actually staining what they were seeing. So they found out that there were things called chromosomes that were inside, what they call chromosomes, which are inside the nucleus. And it's, just, and it's in the chromosomes that one sees these hereditary traits. Now, Thomas Hunt, Morgan came along in the early 1900s and he studied Drosophila or fruit flies. 
And he, he was working with winged and wingless uh, Drosophila and Drosophila that had white or red eyes or, or colors between. And Drosophila was a good choice for him to use because it showed it only had four chromosomes. And so he could tell from which chromosome these traits were being uh, expressed uh, so that you could see them in, in the offspring. A third person I want to mention here is Barbara McClintock. And many of you probably have not heard of her. She, she studied maize in the 1940s, 1950s. And she was studying the features of smooth leaf, and wrinkle leaf, and then more particularly in the seeds or the, like we call it, you know, like corn, maize, the same sort of thing, the seeds. And they were wrinkled, they were smooth, different shapes, but they had different colors and they had a variety of different colors. And so what she did is she, with a lot of work, showed uh, where in the um, uh, maze, where in the specific chromosomes, uh, the, the contributions to the attributes were found so that you might have more than one chromosome giving off something that was causing that feature to be shown, say, a particular color at a particular site on the seedling. Um, in uh, around this time, scientists, you know, this is the mid 50s, early mid, uh, yeah, early to mid 1950s, maybe the 40s. People did not know what molecules were the basis for heredity. There was a lot of discussion. Was it they knew that DNA was in the chromosome, they knew proteins were in the chromosome. So a lot of people thought that proteins, there must be some specific type of proteins that are the real basis, the, the actual molecules that form uh, the hereditary basis of life. Um, in 1944, um, Oswald Avery and his colleagues published a paper which showed definitively that the heredity is, lies in DNA. Um, 1944, if you remember from one of my previous talks, is the same year that Erwin Schrodinger wrote his book, What is Life? So Schrodinger was not aware that DNA itself was the basis for heredity. So it's interesting um, that it's not all that long ago that it turns out that DNA is the basis. <coughs> um, Now, um, a few years, okay, in 1953, um, Watson and Crick published their famous paper in Nature. It's a two-page paper, so it's real short, relatively short, I should say. It's a typical Nature paper um, in which they elucidated the structure of DNA. And I uh, commend you to, to go to that paper and read the paper. And in particular, the last sentence of that paper is one of the most uh, pristine and prophetic uh, sentences I've ever read in the scientific literature. So I, I encourage you to go to that paper, read it. And particularly when you come to that last sentence, you'll say, wow, I think. Now, I want to go into now what 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 is going on here in the central dogma. The central dogma was first proposed by Crick, um, or started it in a few years after this 1953 paper. And what he said is that the information that is lies as a basis of heredity is in DNA, and that is, uh, is expressed and comes out as protein. So you have to go, you, have, you get DNA, I'm sorry, you get proteins from DNA. Whatever the protein is that, itself, however it's constituted, if the information that forms the constituent of protein was in DNA. Watson, uh, two or three years later, was the one who introduced the, the concept that there's an intermediate called RNA. So DNA is transcribed into RNA, which then is translated into proteins. And that's the central dogma. Now, all dogmas are incorrect sometimes, and this one is too. There are ways to attack it. There are ways to look at it, which shows no, this dogma is incorrect. However, it is central and it is still true. And if this is the only dogma that you know about what happens between DNA, RNA, proteins, you're not far off. And you can understand a lot of molecular biology just by adhering to this dogma. 
I'm going to go now into detail here, some detail, not, not a tremendous amount, about what each one of these um, molecules um, or polymers, because that's what they really are, uh, is composed of. <clears throat> the first one is DNA, which is, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. That's where the DNA comes from. Okay, first, there, there are three constituents of DNA. One is the sugar. And in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. Sugars, as you all know, are things that are sweet to most people, like glucose and so forth. The deoxyribose is just happy to be another one of those sugars. The second component is phosphate, is a phosphate ion. And that's what gives it the acidic um, aspect. So that's why it's an acid. Now, DNA is found in the nucleus, so that's where nucleic comes from. So that's so nucleic. Uh, is, is, it's based on the fact that DNA is found in the nucleus. The third constituent is what's called a base. And the reason it's called a base is because the organic molecules themselves have a few nitrogens in them. And nitrogens in organic molecules uh, tend to confer a basic um, aspect from the acid base uh, point of view. So that's why they're called bases. In DNA, there are only four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They typically, there are going, to, you'll see them um, referred to by the first letter of their names, A, T, G, and C. In DNA, as Watson and Crick showed so elegantly, the uh, DNA occurs as two polymers covalently bound to each other, that are exist together. So DNA has here what I've shown as phosphate um, covalently bound to a sugar that's covalently bound to another phosphate sugar and so forth down the line to form this long polymer. Each sugar has covalently bound to itself a base. Um, one of the four bases. Now these bases organically form hydrogen bonds with another one of the four bases. So there's complement, complementarity that occurs between the bases. And so what happens is DNA typically found in solution is double-stranded and the bases themselves form hydrogen bonds. And not only that, but the bases form specific hydrogen bonds with another one of its of, of the four only to the exclusion of the other three. So for example, adenine will only bond in DNA to thymine. Guanine will only hydrogen bond to cytosine. Adenine does not hydrogen bond to guanine nor cytosine and so forth. So you always see this referred to as pairs. Um, now, each one of these sugar phosphate configurations is, is referred to as a nucleotide. So that's what I'm going to use. I'll use NT. And when you see it uh, referred to in general literature, also you see that the complementary nucleotides are referred to as base pairs. So you often see it that this thing is a base pair, or you'll see it as this as being a nucleotide just so that we have the nomenclature down. Again, adenine, thymine, and then guanine, cytosine. So that's, that's what happens. Now from DNA, RNA is transcribed. Um, RNA is, stands for ribonucleic acid. The sugar here is ribose, it's a different sugar. The phosphate's the same, and it has four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, but here it has uracil instead of thymine. So um, you don't find thymine in RNA, you only find uracil. You don't find uracil in DNA, you only find it in RNA. The DNA um, or the, the polymer as, as RNA is usually found in solution as, as a single strand. It is capable of hydrogen bonding to DNA or to other RNAs if what we call the complementary base exists. So for example, if, uh, if, you, if it comes across uh, DNA such, such 
which has um, adenine and guanine cytosine in it, what you'll see is that the adenine will, of RNA will bind to the uh, thymine of the DNA. However, the uracil of the RNA will bind only to the adenine. So adenine binds to uracil, guanine and cytosine bind to each other. So we have the same sugar phosphate, um, but you don't have uh, hydrogen double bonds when it's free in solution, but you do find double bonding between RNA and DNA under appropriate conditions, which happen all the time. Uh, finally, we come down to proteins. Proteins come, are, are translated from the uh, RNA. And the translation is such that the information that's in the DNA or RNA is translated into amino acids. And there are 20 common amino acids so in all proteins. Are you going to be able to get by with the carry-on? Is somebody talking to me about a carry-on? Okay. No, um, I think it's just over talk. Okay. Um, amino acids in proteins are also polymers. So what I've tried to boy my point. Okay. What I tried to do down here is to give you, show you that the amino acid one is co covalently bonded to two, three, four, and so forth to end. So again, these are big polymers and they arrange in a, in a two dimensional and then finally in a three dimensional form when they get into solutions that are found in all of, of the biological systems. Um, now, a couple things to think about here. So the human genome has DNA as its base. As the latest uh, number that I have for the genome size is approximately 3 billion nucleotides. So your genome has something like 3 billion, 3 tenths in the ninth nucleotides in it. There are approximately only 30,000 um, genes. Now a gene is what is expressed as an amino acid uh, or a series of amino acids. The gene is actually the whole expression to give you the protein. So the proteins that are formed, there's only around 30,000 in the human genome. There is some controversy about that, but at least the order of magnitude, that's where we stand. The coding region, what we call the coding region, in other words, the region of DNA that is expressed as proteins is only about one and a half percent of all of the uh, genome that exists. So what the heck is the purpose of the other 98%? Why did biology do this? It gives us 98% that's not gonna be a gene. We'll get into some of that a little bit later, not much, I'm not gonna go too much because that's just an active area of research anyway, right now. But just something to think about, the fact that most of your genome is not being expressed as genes. Um, any questions up to this point? Great. Okay, I'm gonna to go to a cartoon that shows a little bit better sort of a review of, of what, we, uh, what I just talked about. On the right is DNA, and as Washington Crick showed, it's a double helix in which uh, the cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine are shown as colors. And here, uh, this is the only time I'm going to show you the organic structure of each of these bases so you get some sense of what they are. And so we start off here with thymine, which must be uh, hydrogen bonded to adenine, and sure enough, it is. Going around here, the next the one, uh, mm -hmm. here we go. Uh, the next one on this strand is cytosine, which is bonded to guanine and so forth as you go around. So you see this all, this base pairing in this double helix. RNA, obviously, it also will tend to form a helix, but that helix is different um, in form than the double helix here. It's much more flexible. And here we have uracil rather than thymine. You can see there's lots of similarities between the two organically, but they are different. Now, the next slide shows you or gives you a, a, a concise way in which the information that comes from DNA is expressed as 
uh, proteins and particularly into the amino acids. On the left is a, is a, um, uh, a, a diagram or a figure a chart of how the information is being expressed. Um, one thing I should have done on the previous slide is to ask you how that information comes along and how it could be expressed. And we go to information theory here. Uh, DNA only has four nucleotides and there are 20 amino acids. So how can you get an amino acid from uh, these 20 different amino acids from only four nucleotides? Well, okay, four to the first power. I mean, there's only four possibilities if there's only one. Uh, one to one correspondence, that isn't going to do it. What about if you had only two nucleotides together? Well, four squared, that's 16. Okay, there's 16 possibilities for making amino acids. So you're not going to get all 20 amino acids from having two at a time. So you go to the next one, three. Okay, four to the third power, 64. Ah, we can get all 20. But now you've got some redundancy. And sure enough, that's what shows up. There is redundancy in the code that is in your DNA that shows up as amino acids. So for example, over here, leucine, we have six different, um, what we call triplets, triplet codes that can form leucine. In other, in other instances, when we get to, let's say, come down here to methionine, there's only one. There's only one triplet that gives you methionine. Come up here to tryptophan, only one. Others have two, okay, histidine, uh, glutamic acid, aspartic acid, and so forth. These are called codons. These triplets are called codons. They're either called triplets or codons. So we're going to see that as we go on. Um, with the, this is the terminology. Now, how is this translated? Okay, what, what happens? The D, let's say that we have DNA, and I'm going to get, this is just an example out of the top of my head. I don't know if it exists or not, but this is what, what can take place. We have this triplet code, TGG, TTG, ACC, CA, I think that's A. I'm not sure, no, it's CAT, I guess. Now that's transcribed as RNA. So what you do is you look at, you, you find out, well, wait a minute, in RNA, what is it that hydrogen bonds to DNA? And that is, that particular um, nucleotide is what is going to be shown in the RNA. So the RNA, that if, if, if you want to translate this as amino acids, you must get RNA from it, and the RNA is translated as UGG, UUG, ACC, CAU. But because the thymine is no longer exists, it has to be uracil. However, the RNA um, transcript is saying, it, it, it itself came from the other strand of DNA. So the genome is in one strand as you read it. But the opposite strand is what is translated to form the RNA, if you follow me. This is the complementary strand. The complementary strand is ACC because T and A had been bound together, G and C, G and C and so forth. So the complementary strand, when we came to an A, complementary strand um, had to be uracil, a U instead of a thymine. So that's what happens. This complementary strand is what is actually being looked at when RNA is being formed. So the genome translates, or I'm sorry, it's transcribed into its RNA, which looks very similar to this, with the exception that thymine is replaced by uracils. And then once we get to that point, then we say, okay, how is the RNA translated? Okay, well, we go to uh, UGG, okay, uh, man, the RNA, which was UGG here, what is that? Tryptophan, okay, if you go to UUG, it's leucine, ACC, threonine, CAU, histidine, so that's how the translation occurs, all right, so this is how, uh, this, is, this is the, sort of the basis and the background for, for the, uh, uh, 
for biology, <laughs> sort of basic biology. So I want to stop here also and ask our questions because now we're going to go to CRISPR. Any, any questions here? Okay. We're going to yeah, no, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go back to the picture, will you? Yeah. Uh, that one so, is so I see down here, you, you, you say complementary DNA strand, you say ACC, mm -hmm. and RNA is going to transfer that into T, TRP. No, it's going to translate. What's happening is RNA is being transcribed from the complementary DNA. So the right. RNA comes from ACC and forms UGG. So the RNA is actually UGG. Uh, it came from right. the complementary right. strand of the sequence, which is the gene that was is, is going to be expressed. Okay, so now, oh yeah, so now I see UGG becomes the tryptophan. And, yes, uh, yes, and what, yeah. This will be. That's how it's be. translated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The concepts seem to be simple, but when you get into them and start to think about them, they're not so simple. I, you know, yeah. those, those are very smart molecules. They are. And I always, when I got into biophysics and biology, I thought to myself, man, how did biology figure this out? What is going on? And I still do. Uh, the things that, the discoveries that I see in molecular biology particularly, is just, it really just, it's fascinating. It's a tremendous field. It, the it, term they use for the two strands of the one that, that has the primary codon <clears throat> it's called the sense and then the one that's complementary is the anti-sense right and the rna comes off the anti-sense and becomes a sense rna yeah. that's how you get to that step that's not shown in the in the graphic yeah thanks jerry that is correct yeah. anything else yes is is there any uh, idea of why certain amino acids have so many codes and some have one or two there are people who have have discussed this, thought about this, and no, I, I there's nothing that I can put my finger on that says why it happened that way. Um, if you think about it from an evolutionary sense, there's probably reasoning behind it. It could be that uh, there's more mutations <laughs> in in some of the codons that cause uh, cause the uh, the organism to lose its vitality, and so you wanted to have more redundancy in the code for that. So it's just easier. I, but that's really speculation. I am, yeah, nobody has any idea of it. Well, I know. Well, one idea is that viruses, because uh, you know, like the hepatitis virus yeah. can insinuate its way into the DNA. And it may be that that along the way, genes have been transferred from one species or to another, and uh, they've used different, different uh, mechanisms. And so, uh, it becomes multilingual, kind of like a Tower of Babel because of so many different ways, uh, uh, different inputs. Yeah, that's true. We may get into more of a discussion of that feature, but um, I, I, I don't think that that really explains why there is that redundancy because it does get in. Uh, we'll see in my next slide, we'll see that the, the material that comes from an external source gets into the uh, into the hereditary material, the DNA of, of the host. Um, but what difference does it make whether the DNA is coded CUU or CUC or CUA? It doesn't make any difference. And if, they, and if this gets transferred to another um, system, you know, it's going to be transferred that way. They, they should have equal uh, opportunity. Uh, it's just a, what, uh, what Jerry's talking about in terms of the... Of the um, what we call skipping and so forth um, occurs all the time in biology. It's, it's, it's occurring in your cells right now. Um, but I, I, I personally don't see where that explains it. Maybe it does, but I, I, I'm not sure of it. Nick, before you go on, just a, a quick question. The, sure. the, chart, the chart you have up, you have uh, three highlights of red and they say stop. Ah. Can you just talk to that, please? Yeah. Okay, good. You caught it. Um, okay, if you look at this chart carefully, like like um, uh, like Peter did, you'll see one of them is in green, AUG, and three are in red, UAA, uh, UAG, and UGA. When proteins are being made from RNA, 
they always start with AUG. Methionine is always the first amino acid that's being formed. Wow. Okay. It's always the first one. Now, it might be chopped off later, but it's always the first one. That's called the start codon. So this is the start of the translation of RNA into proteins. And then going down, when it gets to the UAA or a UAG or a UGA, that's the stop codon. The uh, protein translation and manufacturer stops there. So it doesn't just keep going down the RNA. It comes to a stop and it stops amino acid synthesis uh, or forming into uh, protein stops there. And that's what those are. So I, that, that's a good catch. I wasn't going to say anything about it until somebody asked, but yeah, actually, that's an excellent catch. That's what's going on. So in, in essence, they're bookends of the, uh, of the formula. Yeah, right. In terms of the protein itself, the amino acid sequences, yep. You start with a methionine and you go on. Now you might, if you don't come to another, to a stop codon and you come to another AUG, that gets translated into methionine. So you can have methionines in the midst of the protein sequence. And you see that all the time, but you have to get, you have to, get to a stop codon before it stops translating. And that's kind of unique in biology, isn't it? How does it do that? Why does it do that? But it does. Dick? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So are there really 21 uh, amino acids? <laughs> there, are, there are 20 common. If you, if you copy this and go back and look at it, you'll see there's 20 common amino acids. There are other amino acids. They are uncommon, um, and they come from, oh, how to say, organic um, uh, changes to these amino acids. So you see some other amino acids that occur, that occur in nature. They're uncommon, and they don't come from this translation. Um, but they do occur. Yeah, there are. There are 21 in the chart, though. 21? Yeah. You sure? Uh, maybe 20. I'll have to go back and look at it, but I think there's only 20. Methionine, Sometimes it's, is methionine counted or not? Yes. Yeah, I found 21. Okay. Hmm. I'll have to go back and look at that. Last time I looked at it, I only saw 20, but okay. Um, let me think, what was the other thing that I was gonna say? Hmm. Um, okay. Oh, another thing I was gonna say, what about if there, couldn't you have four nucleotides? Okay, four to the fourth power. What, is that 256? Um, yes, that is possible. However, biology stopped at three. That was enough to make the amino acids. Um, people have looked to see if, if uh, a code that has four nucleotides in sequence, if, if you can get amino acids from that. And it turns out that that does not seem to be the case. And you have to look at how the translation occurs between RNA to protein to see how it's that's, that's a relatively complex uh, process, biological process that goes on. And the way it does, it only uses three. It turns out probably the reason it does that because that's the most efficient way for biology to, to keep going, to have just three and not have that redundancy carry out to the fourth power. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to go to CRISPR. Um, now CRISPR arose from studying the immune response in bacteria. And I've shown up here also archaea. Archaea is another life form. Um, bacteria are what we call prokaryotes. That is, they're, they're, so they're single cell organisms that do not have a true nucleus as we think of it. It has DNA, but it does not have a nucleus that you can see by microscopy. Um, 
the the um, biological system that we belong to are called eukaryotes. And so most of what you see around you are called eukaryotic organisms. And these are the ones that have nuclei that you can actually see that have chromosomes and so forth. Now, people have been studying immunology for a long time, and they've been studying in, in molecular biology, most of the information that we have uh, of a really true significant nature comes from the study of prokaryotes or bacteria. Um, oh, let me talk about the archaea for just a second. Archaea is a third form. It's not a prokaryote or a eukaryote. It's a third form. And it's found in hostile environments, such as around uh, the sulfur vents at the bottom of the ocean, uh, the round heat sources, or um, acid, very acidic areas. So archaea are found in those, um, those sites. And it might be, if we ever find out if there's life forms on Mars, that the Martian life form may be an archaeal life form. It's hard to tell, but it certainly is a hostile environment and maybe that's what they're gonna be. So I just put it up there because people do study that a little bit now. Okay, so the study of bacteria, it, like I said uh, in, in, the, in the couple of minutes ago, is a lot of our knowledge of molecular biology comes from the study of bacteria. And the bacteria themselves do have an immune system different than ours. Now, in us, in, in eukaryotes, we get invaded by viruses. Bacteria do not get invaded by viruses, they get invaded by phage. And I have a, a uh, Oh, uh, something in my craw that, that when somebody talks about a bacterial virus, no, bacteria don't get viruses. You don't find a, a, uh, a flu virus in a bacterium. It doesn't get there naturally. You can get there artificially, but not naturally. Conversely, you don't find phages in eukaryotic cells. It just doesn't happen. So I separate the two, and I do that um, mainly because I'm a hard nose about it. But secondly, because when you're studying this, you don't learn things that are only specific to the bacteria, don't carry over to the, to the, uh, to the uh, eukaryotic organism and vice versa. But a lot of it does transfer. And by studying the bacteria, you learn an awful lot that can be translated or transferred to the humans. And this is what happens with uh, the study of CRISPR. CRISPR uh, came from the study of immunology of bacteria. Now, wh why is it that bacteria can exist when there's lots of copies of a, of a phage around it that wants to invade it. And, and as it invades, just, uh, you know, it kills the bacteria because it's, it takes the bacteria's um, uh, biochemistry and, and usurps it for, for the sole purpose of making more phage to spit out to invade other uh, bacteria. A lot of what happens is bacteria become immune. Now, why does this happen? How does this happen? All right, in the study, the phage will attach to the cell membrane and assert its genetic DNA into the cell cytoplasm. That's the first thing that happens when the phage comes in. And what I'm gonna talk about here um, happens, uh, the study was on specific bacterial strains, but it's not the, the general concepts that, that we'll talk about also apply to lots of not most other bacterial strains. Hey, Dick, can, can you define phage for me, please? I think I missed it or you didn't get to it. Yeah, I didn't say what a phage is. A phage really is akin to a virus in the sense that a phage has two general components. One is nucleic acid, in other words, hereditary material, which can be transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins. And secondly, it has something around it, some sort of a cage around it. It's usually kind of a, a sugar kind of a structure. And that's what a phage is. It's it, it, the only way that a phage can exist and live is by invading a bacterium, causing the bacterium then to propagate more of itself, reproduce and go on. If you think about biology, biology in one sense is the process of reproduction. 
That's its only reason to exist. So if you want to think about it, we exist to reproduce. And if we didn't reproduce, we'd die out. And that's the way with cells. They die I'll out. Tell that to my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> you try that on. <laughs> Um, and then similarly, the viruses work the same way, as, as Jerry has talked about a few times. The viruses work the same way. They're the same kind of thing. When they invade eukaryotic cells, they have it specific, you know, pretty much it's the same thing. They have their nucleic acid, base of their heredity. They invade the eukaryotic cell. Uh, again, they're, they're encapsulated by some sort of a coating. Um, they invade the cell, put, it's, put their DNA into the cell, force the cell then to reproduce, take over. Uh, the machinery of the cell takes over the reproduction of the material that forms that virus, kills the cell, and spits out the virus. So it's the same kind of process that goes on in both cases. So phage just is particular to, to uh, uh, bacteria or prokaryotic cells, but they're very similar in the way that they work. And that's why a lot of people think of, to talk about bacterial viruses when they're really not viruses, they're phage. I mean, to me, that's, that's the key. Um, Okay, so what, secondly, if there's no other questions, uh, secondly, the cell machinery takes up portions of this phage DNA and inserts it into its cellular DNA. I think Jerry mentioned the viruses uh, have a, pen, a propensity somewhat to do that to, to eukaryotic cells. The bacterial cells work this way. They um, take some of the phage DNA and incorporated into their cellular DNA. You may ask why, and as we go through, you'll see why. It's for the purpose of immunology. So jumping down to the this, to this second paragraph here, what happens is that after this has been incorporated, the, the, the bacterial um, RNA that came from the DNA that had the uh, phage betrayal injected or, or incorporated into it has these features if when you really narrow down to specific areas. The features are a spacer followed by a uh, sequence of nucleotides, followed by another spacer, followed by the same sequence of nucleotides and so forth, so that you can have several of these uh, spacer uh, nucleotide sequences. Now, each one of these spacers are RNA portions that came from the DNA of the phage. Okay, so each spacer, spacer one, spacer two, and so forth, actually are, are, are have been encoded from the phage DNA. This, the, the sequence that I put here, and this is something that I've made up. I, this doesn't come out of, out, of, out of any literature, something I made up from knowledge of what's going on here. What I've done in bold is put in the RNA sequence, C-U-U-A-T-G. And if you look over here, C-A-U-A-A-G. If you look real close, and you gotta, you gotta follow me on this, that G here, can hydrogen bond to the C. The A can hydrogen bond to the U. This A can hydrogen bond to this U, and so forth. U to A, A to T, C to G. They can do that, okay? They are complementary, but they can do that. And therein lies palindromes. That's why these are palindromic sequences, okay? They're regularly spaced. You see them, they're, they form this regular pattern, lots of them. They're interspaced, space, space, interspaced in palindromic sequences. These are palindromes. It's a different way of thinking of palindrome, but it's because of the complementarity that forces them to be called palindromes. All right, the palindromic uh, things themselves, as we go on, are often referred to as dyads or repeats. And I've tried to, in the later slides, just use the word repeats. There are typically 28 to 37 nucleotides in length. And the spacers uh, that come from the, uh, the RNA that came from the phage are constant in length, but they'll have a length of somewhere between 25 and 35 nucleotides. But each one in, in each species 
it's going to be pretty much you're going to see a constant length there, whereas the um, uh, the palindromes may be somewhat different in length. They don't have to be exactly the same, but typically they are pretty close. Later on, what happens in the bacterium is that, is that the RNA is then cleaved by a back, uh, uh, an enzyme in, uh, in the bacterium. Uh, and RNA, so we're going to now get into some nomenclature of, of uh, enzymes and proteins and so forth. And RNA is a protein that cleaves the covalent bond uh, that forms between two nucleotides in RNA. Uh, similarly, a DNA is a uh, protein enzyme that cleaves that bond. Remember, that's the strongest bond in chemistry, at least the ones I showed before. So it takes quite a bit of energy to, to break it, but in biology, this happens all the time. These bonds are being formed and broken all the time. You're having millions of them happening inside your cells right now, being formed and broken all the time, okay? So this cleavage occurs. Now it's either an RNA or what's called a Cas protein. And we'll come down to Cas in just a second. So that um, what's left is then that is that you're left with these RNA um, sequences that are just the spacer, a particular spacer, plus that's palindromic repeat. And that's all it is. So you get a number of these that differ from each other depending on what the spacer is. The palindrome is the same, but the spacer is different. So that's what's formed out there. And this is what flies around in the cell itself, uh, the bacterial cell, and they sit out there. And what happens is that these repeats bind to the DNA of subsequent invasions of the phage via this Cas. And Cas comes from CRISPR associated. That's what Cas means. See, another, another acronym, group of proteins. Okay, these Cas proteins use the spacers to bind to the DNA because the spacer came from the DNA to begin with. So it's gonna to bind to the DNA. And the Cas proteins have DNases in them and they will cleave these RNA DNA complexes. Okay, and they cleave it within that spacer region. In other words, the region that originated from the phage genome itself into pieces, small pieces, or relatively small pieces. And then the bacteria, once they see these small pieces, they get rid of it. Um, bacterial cells, eukaryotic cells are constantly making and breaking up uh, uh, biochemicals. It, it's a constant thing. It's, it's all done all the time. It's one of the main uh, energy sucking uh, parts of life, making and breaking these bonds and then making breaking up these larger uh, polymers into smaller pieces and that could either be excluded or can be used over again. You take the amino acids and you get down the amino acid sides, you use them over again and so forth. All right, so this is a very common thing. Now, Cas is a very interesting um, group of molecules. They're proteins because uh, enzymes, all, all enzymes are proteins. Um, uh, a protein is, is probably, the, probably the major to be, it's a major molecule of, of, of life. They form structures and they carry on tremendous number of, of chemical functions, mainly enzymatic functions. Uh, that is making breaking bonds and making the molecules and so forth. Um, Cas to me is more important than the, the, the CRISPR itself. You know, the CRISPR is just this thing here, that's the CRISPR. But Cas uses the CRISPR and Cas can go on and carry out its, its, uh, its function in lots of different ways. Um, anything about this before I go on? Let me uh, recapitulate a little bit here. This is a, this is a, a diagram uh, that shows what happened in the immune system. Okay, this is a phage. Okay, this is... The reason it's drawn this way is because um, from microscopy, uh, particularly electron microscopy and so forth, this is a particular kind of a phage, what it looked like. Um, it's kind of a unique kind of a structure, physical structure. 
What happens is it attaches itself to the membrane of the bacterium. It, it inserts its DNA here. The bacteria has a number of genes in it, and these genes form something like cas proteins, which then look at this DNA when it comes in, and it will then take that, that DNA and it will form here. It forms this spacer repeat stuff, which, oh, I hate this which shows up as this CRISPR array. So arrays, you have repeat, spacer, repeat, spacer. Each spacer is different, remember, because it comes from a different part of the genome of the um, phage. Uh, we won't talk about this right here. We're gonna get that in like the next slide. But anyway, what happens after this is that this maturate, what's called a CRISPR RNA maturation occurs in which these Cas proteins or these RNAs then take this uh, RNA that was formed from this CRISPR array that's in the bacterial genome, chops it up into the single unique sequences here. So you have one uh, spacer, two, this uh, repeat, which you can see forms, actually does form the RNA, it does form double, a double um, I'm sorry, hydrogen bonds. So it does form that way and it, it forms a loop. And this is, this is very common, this is seen all the time. So each one of these then can look for a different, uh, next time this uh, phage attaches, next time it comes along and attaches, it will recognize it here. This one recognizes it because its RNA is going to be complementary to the DNA of the, of, the, um, of the phage, recognizes it and the Cas proteins then cleave it break it in pieces, All right? Okay, so that's CRISPR. That's, that's the basis of it. Now we're gonna go on. Um, this is information that is maybe 10 years old or even newer than that. More knowledge about the CRISPR, um, what, what's going on in this, in this uh, Area and again, this is this is taken from studies of bacteria. The Cas genes, in other words, the genes that encode the Cas proteins, are located upstream. That is, as you read the RNA, you're reading it from one end to the other. So, read it coming if it from a source or from one end, you're reading it. That's upstream, and if it's downstream from whatever you're talking about, it's it's later in the reading of that genome. Uh, the Cas genes are located upstream and they're closely uh, adjacent to the CRISPR. So when you see the bacterial genome, you find these CRISPR loci and upstream from it, uh, several, nucle uh, several hundred nucleotides upstream from it, you find the genes that encode Cas. In addition, there is what's called a tracer RNA. Tracer, again, this is another acronym, transactivated activating CRISPR RNA. This is located upstream from the Cas genes as I've shown here. And it's the, the, the tracer RNA comes from the opposite or the complementary DNA strand from which the um, phage DNA was located. So it's the complementary strand and that tracer RNA can hybridize by uh, hydrogen bonds with individual palindromic repeats, remember, that occur here. So this is a tracer, which is, can hybridize with that. And it's upstream from the Cas proteins. What do you mean by hybridize? Uh, I'm sorry, hybridize, when I say hybridize, I mean by um, hydrogen bonding. Always hydrogen bond is what I mean by hybridize, always. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't define it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so it hybridizes with that. Um, and it turns out that that tracer RNA was necessary and it works in conjunction with the CRISPR RNA, which now is CRRNA. And, and, that's, and both of those are necessary for the Cas proteins to cleave the DNA. 
Okay. I put or R in there because there are situations where when casts and these things do clear on it, but that's not our main focus here. Um, now, one of the big things that happened, um, I just mentioned that if you remember a year ago, the Nobel Prize was given for CRISPR to two, um, two people, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. And one of their main contributions was the fact that they could take tracer RNA, which was discovered by um, Carpentier, and they covalently bound them together. So they formed a big or longer polymer of these two, and they had the same activity as if they were uh, separate, which happens in bacteria uh, normally. They're, they're separate polymers. The tracer RNA, the CRISPR RNA are separate when they uh, are, are incorporated into the Cas protein system. Okay, that's one major feature that happens here. Now, Dick, further. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a question? Yeah, just do me a favor, please. What is the purpose of cleaving? Why do we want to cleave these things and what, what's going on? Did I miss that? No, you didn't miss it. Um, the cleaving is done to break it apart. So you, to, to break the polymer apart so that it can't be used for the purpose in which it was made to begin with. So let's take the um, DNA sequence that forms a gene. You can't translate that gene uh, from the start codon to the stop codon to make the protein that you want if the gene has been uh, cut up, okay? What happens is that the translation, I'm sorry, yeah, the trans, the, well, the transcription, let alone the translation, stops at that at that breaking point because it can't find the next the next uh, nucleotide in, in the sequence. So if it's broken up, it, as what's happened is that you've destroyed the activity of whatever molecule it, it is. Same thing for proteins. If you break a protein up, if you break the hydrogen bonds between the amino acids and the proteins, those proteins are. Uh, sometimes called denature. Now, denaturation is a little bit, uh, has, a, has a more broad definition than that, but that's what happens. That protein no longer can carry on its function. Secondly, uh, so Dick, the cells point, are looking at these and they are, when, once they see the stuff broken up, they say, well, this has no value to me, so I'm going to break it up further now and, and extract what I can from it and expel what I can't use. So uh, it, it, it signals the cell then to break it up even further. So is this a naturally occurring process that existed yes. before we yeah. did any artificial? Yes, yeah, it happens all the time. It's happening in your cells right now. Oh, okay, yeah. so, so, so the CRISPR process is just identify what, you know, if I can look at it as a high level, is has identified this cleaving process and then uh, people start to use it to our advantage to break things certain ways so that we can manipulate things to our advantage. Exactly. That's what I'm hearing. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. I'll, I'll get to that hopefully today. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what what the advantage of CRISPR is, but you, you've hit the nail on the head, Peter. Yeah, that's that's where the big that's one of the main things, but it is happening. Uh, and, and, and we've been able to, to do these sorts of things before CRISPR came along. CRISPR is just the latest. And something that was happening and being investigated all the time. Um, but yeah, that's his main thing. It's much more, uh, to put it in a nutshell, CRISPR is more specific. And uh, we'll go into that, why it's more specific and how it's being used in that, in that way. But you, yeah, great question. And that's exactly oh, what's going on. I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So, so first of all, presumably when the uh, bacterium that has this uh, sequence in it uh, reproduces by division, that its offspring continue to have that sequence. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. yes. And so, so the immunity is passed on. Yes. And so how did the first one get it? Because you would think that it was invaded and, and uh, you know, it somehow it survived the invasion. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how it does, how it does. I, I, I don't want to go into the details of how it makes, how it makes, how it breaks apart the original, um, 
incorporation into smaller subunits so that each one has a spacer and a repeat in it. Um, it's, it's complicated, but it's not complicated if you understand sort of the basics of what's happening. But the actual incorporation itself, uh, like, like your question about the original incorporation, um, the bacteria, as they evolved, they came up with this system of immunity. Uh, you can ask yourself, why do, why do we have a much more complicated immune system? It's because this is the way we have survived as a species. It just biology continues to evolve. It works that way. It, it, it uses physics and chemistry to do what it does. It tries things out. And if they work, you keep them. If they don't work, you get rid of them or they die out in, in subsequent generations. Now, how the bacterium did this to begin with, I don't know why, if you want to get to that point, it does it because that makes it immune. It's, it, it found a way of immunity against that particular phage. If there were another phage that came along, same thing would happen to it. It would get incorporated the same way. So you could have a bacterium that is, is immune to more than one phage. Uh, gentlemen, what we get into is Darwin's theory of natural selection and uh, random mutations, which have a selective advantage. Yeah, that, that's, that's an explanation that has come from this, or this came from that, depending on- how This came from that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about that. I, I would I would have an argument off offline with you about that. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? Good comments. Good questions. I, this is great because I, I know that I'm some things out that I just take for granted, unfortunately. All right. The third. Dick, just Wait. a heads up. The the clock says uh, eleven sixteen. Yep. So if you get to a natural breaking point in the next 15, 20 minutes. That would be a good thing unless people want to hang out, you know, or or unless you're going to, be, you know, you're going to be over just a few more minutes after that. So yeah, just let me see where I am in 15 minutes. See what slide am I on now? Uh, yeah, we can schedule part two, not to worry. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, Peter, that we may have to do that. Uh, and we knew that was a possibility when we talked about it. So it's yeah. not, not a big deal. Yeah, exactly. Um, so why don't you just go ahead and... Uh, and somewhere around eleven thirty or so, we'll uh, you, you know you can you can decide what you want to do. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking yeah, I think, yeah, um, yeah, I I should get. Hopefully, I'll get to a place where it'll be a great breaking point. If I don't, it, we won't be too far off. Okay, uh, the third the thing. Thanks. The third uh, region here is what's called a a, a PAM. Okay, another acronym. It comes from protospacer adjacent motifs. That's what PAMs are. Uh, okay, a PAM is a two to six nucleotide sequence, very short, very short sequence. An example I give here is NGG, where N stands for any of the four uh, uh, nucleotides or nucleic acids, uh, the individual nucleic acids. G, of course, is guanine. Um, so they're very short. And they're located a couple of, of uh, nucleotides downstream from the sequences on the complementary strand to that contains the spacer uh, or the, what's the spacer or target. In this case, I'm saying a protospacer or target. Now, protospacer and spacer, um, I've been fighting with this now since I started to put this talk together. Um, they're, that they're historical. And protospacer used to be thought to be different than spacer. From what I can tell now, protospacer and spacer mean the same thing. Uh, the reason I call protospacer, proto is, uh, means before. Uh, so something happened biologically or chemically to make the spacer. From what I can tell, they really are the same thing, but I'm not real positive about that. So I keep it. Not only that, because if you start to go into literature, you're gonna see PAMs. You're not gonna be you're not gonna see, you're not gonna see SAMs, you're gonna see PAMs. It's not gonna be spacer, it's gonna be protospacer. It's just Anyway, they're short. They're, they're on the complementary strand to the strand that, that uh, contains the code that you're trying to find that you want to break. Okay. And this, these PAM sequences are recognized by the Cas proteins. When the Cas proteins, along with their spacers and tracer, uh, start to interrogate the DNA to see whether they want to break it up. Okay. 
Let me go through that again. The PAM sequence is on the opposite strand of the DNA under investigation by the Cas proteins. The Cas proteins actually recognize this. And it's probably because these, this particular sequence, even though it's very short, existed um, near or right next to the uh, nucleic acid of the phage. So it's right next to where that spacer was. Anyway, it's being recognized. And that's kind of, that's very unique in, in, in genetic engineering, that you've got something that's this short. Because if you think about it, NGG, I mean, that is a lot of things that can code for that. You come across that all the time in the DNA. So, you know, what's going on here? Well, turns out that, that, the, that the CAS system looks at this all the time. If it doesn't find it, it jumps to the next one. Doesn't find it, jumps to the next one. And then the, the, the next thing in the cascade that I'm going to talk about right now occurs. Okay, so this was, the PAMs were only found, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> 10 years ago or less. Next to the next to next thing that came along with it, what's what was called the seed region, and this came out of the discovery of the tracer. This is about a 10 nucleotide sequence, which is located at the downstream end of the spacer sequence. In other words, it's in the spacer sequence, but it's in the downstream end, so it's in the end, it is close to the repeat. So if you go up here to the spacer, this 10 nucleotide, what's called a seed sequence, is here. Now, is the reason that, they, that, that the uh, investigators uh, found this and, and showed this is that when the CAS is uh, interrogating the DNA of the subject, um, the first thing it looks for is this, is this 10 nucleotide sequence. It actually goes through um, some uh, morphological changes of its, of its um, uh, protein structure. Uh, where it's looking and, and it actually takes that first like 10 nucleotide sequence, the, 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 uh, of, of, of what's called the seed region. And that, that, that's, that thing is also found in the tracer RNA. So it's the tracer RNA that really contains the seed region plus the um, repeat or the, yeah, the diet repeat, okay, in the complex. And then, once that occurs, once they see that, cleavage occurs, okay? And the cleavage occurs anywhere in the spacer region. Typically, and in CAS, uh, particularly one CAS, the CAS9, which maybe some of you have seen, that one occurs only three nucleotides away from the PAM site. So it's real close to the PAM site. And so it's in the spacer region, it's in the seed region, it is only three nucleotides away. It's very specific. So as Peter was saying, you've got real specificity, specificity going on here. And that's where it does. And it cleaves both strands of DNA once that occurs. This is a cartoon in, okay. Well, I can get to this cartoon. This is a cartoon and hopefully you'll, you'll, you're able to read it. It's not as good as the other cartoons I had. Uh, it's a little bit fuzzy, but let me go through it. Um, in a little bit here. All right, this structure is the CAS system. Okay, the CAS system in this instance has been subdivided into two lobes. In other words, these are three-dimensional structures of the CAS system. A REC or RAC, which is the recognition lobe, and NUC, that's nuclease, which is for uh, DNA or uh, RNA activity. That's why it's called a nuclease lobe. And they contain other subregions, which we won't go into here. However, it does have what's called a disordered PAM region. This is a region of the CAS system, which is going to look for those PAMs. Now, the, the system that uh, Carpentier and Valdner put together here, I'm is being shown here now as a single structure. In other words, it's taken the CRISPR RNA and the trans RNA and hooked them together covalently bonded. So you do see these structures. You always see these hydrogen bond structures here. They're still there. The seed region is the beginning of the, of the uh, uh, region, which is to be recognized as part of the phage. Uh, and then the rest of it is here. Now, don't, don't pay attention to this. HNH is actually behind this part of the, of the um, 
uh, tracer, I'm sorry, the spacer region, okay? Now it's, um, this is being put in here, it's now looking at the, a, a PAM site. Now, let's say that once the DNA comes along, okay, it looks here, it tries to find it, and it's looking for this PAM region. Again, it's on the complementary portion. It's not on the target strand. It's not on the strand to be to be uh, hybridized, uh, hydrogen bonded to by the by the uh, tracer and uh, CAS system. It's on the other. It's, uh, it's on the other side. It's on this one. It's right next to it. So what happens is that it recognizes this and says, "Okay, let's go on." Now let's say it doesn't recognize it. It very quickly comes off. Very quickly. And that's another advantage of CRISPR that it looks for this. If it doesn't see this occurring, once it sees this, it looks for this. If it doesn't see it, it comes off very quickly. It goes to the next one. So this is a quick interrogation, an, an initial interrogation. Biology has really, you know, come a long way to do that. Now let's say that it does find the PAM. All right. What happens is that it causes the DNA to start to untwist. And there and therein lies another part of chemistry. Why does it untwist? It's because of the way that the Cas system is interacting with the DNA. All right, it finds it. It looks for it. It's called DNA melting, and then the RNA strand begins to come in and invade. Up here, it didn't invade. It just looked for the PAM. But now it's found the PAM. It says, "Okay, let's go on." So it's going to look for this seed region. It begins to unwind. Looks for the seed region. Aha. Okay, we get more and more of it. Okay, it begins to bind to it. All right, so the seed region binds. Um, let's say it didn't bind. Well, then it would come off. So that's why we have the other arrow comes off and it then re, uh, dis, uh, dis attaches, no, unattaches and goes on, looks for the next PAM, it goes on from there. But let's say it does. Now the seed region has come in. You get more unwinding of the DNA. And then the rest of the of the uh, uh, spacer comes in, recognizes the rest of the you know it's the second part of this recognition recognizes the rest of it, hydrogen bonds with it. Then these nucleases come in and they cleave. So you got it happening. So it's a number of steps <clears throat> that goes on, and then the cleavage occurs. Then this is no longer. Um, the phage no longer can can have itself being reproduced because it's being has been its uh, DNA its uh, um, hereditary material has been broken up and is not recognized as anything that forms any useful structures. So that is that's how the CRISPR system works. Um, yeah, this is an, I've got eleven twenty seven. So let me break here. If that's okay. Now I think it's kind of a natural uh, point because from here. I'm going to go get more broadly into what's happening today. Unfortunately, I've brought you up to what's what's been happening in say the past uh, three or four years in genetic engineering, where we now have been able to take CRISPR and apply it to eukaryotic systems, um, and that's that's the next part of the talk is is what what goes on there. But now now you have a good basis for what CRISPR really is, at least you know. It, it's hopefully anyway you have a good basis of what of, of CRISPR. Any any further questions? Any questions? I I can stay here for a while if you want. Well, on a historical note, um, Edwin Chargaff he uh, he was Jewish and he was forced out of Europe during the war and he came to America where he went to he became a professor at Columbia, and I, I was there. He gave us three lectures on. Uh, DNA. He was the one who discovered that adenine matched with guanine and cytosine was matched with thymine in every spe in every species, and um, and his he gave three one hour lectures, and in total we got three one hour lectures on why he should have been given the Nobel Prize but didn't get it. So that's what I learned about Edwin Chargaff. <laughs> You no, know, he, he is a pioneer. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. But he was very bitter that he didn't get the Nobel Prize. 
And when I took a course of DNA in Harvard, I met John Watson, uh, who was a young guy, and he had his research basically used everybody else's research, and he just put it, he put the the final sort of the cherry on the, on the on the on the Sunday, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. But he didn't do the crystallography. He didn't do the he didn't do any of the stuff. He just put it all together. You know, there should be a club of people who are bitter about not receiving a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> are you in that club, Charlie? I wish I were. <laughs> Oh, Dick, this oh. is great. This, 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 I'm glad you stopped here because my brain is very full. <laughs> By the way, in that club, there might be Feng Zhang, who did a lot of really important work on, on uh, CRISPR. Yeah, I, I didn't want to go there with that one. <laughs> okay, I have my own thoughts about that. I have studied the, uh, the um, patent situation that... Uh, Zhang is involved. He's a, he's a great guy. Don't 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 get me long, wrong about that. He did do some some pioneering work, but I I take that with a grain of salt because Dalna and Carpentier and some of their collaborators were doing the same thing at the same time as he did. Uh, actually, Zhang, if you want to put some somebody else local here that fits in that, it's George Church, who is a um, molecular biologist, Harvard. Uh, I think he's with the med school, pretty sure he is. And he did as much, if not more, than Zhang did. I think they worked together quite a bit. Uh, Zhang has a great lab, and they're doing fantastic work. Um, in terms of attribution, um, yeah, that's something that I've thought about many years in terms of attributions for Nobel Prizes. Um, everybody thinks that uh, Watson and Crick uh, should have shared it with uh, Rosalind Franklin, who was in Wilkins' lab at... Uh, uh, is it Oxford or Cambridge? Cambridge, I think it was, in England. And so the Nobel Prize should have gone to her too because she was the one who was working on the crystal structure that, yeah. that uh, was being looked at for the... She, uh, she was yeah, dead she was when dead. the DNA. Yeah, she was, was dead she when the awards were made. Yeah, uh, let me see. Was she dead when, they, when the Nobel Prize was given? Yes. She yeah. died early, I know that. But she was not given recognition by them, by by either of the three, by Wilkins. I, I mean, um, that is right. I mean, the, the lack of but, recognition is shameful. Yeah, but the, but but the Nobel you, Prize could could not have gone to her. At that, if you look further at that, she didn't take the picture that they used. Her graduate student took the picture. So when you come to attribution, even though I agree with all of you that in many times the Nobel Prizes are, are not properly attributed, it's a difficult decision that those guys have to make about that as to who, who, who should get the, who should get it. And I totally agree hundred percent that those who do not get it, who have done pioneering work and are not recognized for it, should have done it. Barbara McClintock is another one. She should have been recognized for the work she did. She came up with trisomy. But Mc, McClintock got a Nobel Prize. Prize. He was also the first one to show what we now call jumping genes in May, she saw it. And she tried to promote that idea and nobody would buy it. And so she stopped actually publicizing it. And it was like 20 or 30 years later, the people came along, showed the same kind of a system working in bacteria. And she, but she was the first one to promote that idea. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to do that. Well, Dick, my, fa my father felt he should have shared the Nobel Prize. Robert Woodward went to Quincy High School and was in my father's class. And, <laughs> and he, uh, Woodward went to MIT and my father went to Tufts. Yeah. And one bitterly cold January night, he, my father and, some, and his friend and his roommate were walking across the bridge from, uh, from Boston to Cambridge. And it was about one o'clock in the morning and everybody out drinking. And uh, Robert w Woodward had fallen down drunk on the bridge and would have frozen to death. So my father and his uh, roommate recognized him and uh, being a classmate in high school, they picked him up and, and carried him to his dorm. And without that, he Woodward would have never won the Nobel Prize. And my father always felt that he should have shared it. 
<laughs> well, they didn't explain that to the committee. Well, obviously not. But <laughs> well, they didn't accept it anyway. Well, the, actually, the, the the committee doesn't 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 talk to the people who they give it to. They talk to a lot of other people, but not to the people. Who so, well, so. The, the fact of the matter, not the fact. My belief is that the committee has long time had a problem with gender. Yeah, you know, they did. Women, women, women weren't you know biologically capable of doing real science and, and real work. But it's that a, was society at that time too. It wasn't just the committee. Oh, Everybody was like we, that. We, the whole philosophical discussion. You can get into yeah. it. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, Marie well, Curie, I, I'd like to tell. A, I'd like to tell an anecdote, which I think is a more cheerful sort that has to do with Nobel Prize, because uh, Willie Fowler at Caltech got the Nobel Prize in 1983. Shared it with two other people. Uh, for determining how the chemical elements are made in the stars. And on his way to uh, Sweden to get his Nobel Prize, he was in an airport waiting room, and there was Barbara McClintock, who was mm. on her way to yes. get a Nobel Prize, get the Nobel Prize in physiology. And, uh, and Willie Fowler, very characteristic of Willie, went over to her and said, would you let me kiss you? I have never kissed a Nobel Prize winner. Oh! And she got up and gave him a good smiling kiss saying, well, neither have I. <laughs> Excellent story, Charlie. Yeah, it is good. Yeah, McClintock's story is very interesting. Yeah, she wasn't at, at Caltech, just shortly, not there very long. Uh, Watson is a, was an interesting character. I, I've I met him just casually once, uh, a couple of talks that he gave. He's an interesting character, an interesting guy.